I started gardening with my brother one summer just to be out of the house, to just have a hobby that existed outside. And be like, look, like here's my little gardening blog, it's doing well. What, what was the inflection point? When did this thing start to take off? It took a long time. I run a business called Epic Gardening, and it's been a crazy ride of like being a blogger to being a YouTuber, and then a podcaster, then like an e-com, and then kind of building a whole team around it. So how did you know to go all in on this? My logic was... Kevin, how we doing? We're doing well, man. Thanks for doing this. Uh, everyone, this is Kevin Espiritu. So I met Kevin in person uh, at a investor's conference, and he does a, he's got this amazing business called Epic Gardening, mm -hmm. right? And he does a whole host of things, so this is going to be a wide-ranging conversation. But Kevin, what did I miss in that intro? Please add. That's pretty much it. I mean, I, I run a business called Epic Gardening, which I started... I think technically in 2013, but full time 2016, and it's been a crazy ride of like being a blogger to being a YouTuber, and then a podcaster, then like an ecom, yeah, and then kind of building a whole team around it and making acquisitions and all that. So it's that's it. What what kind of numbers can you share around the business? Like, there's you got the YouTube, all the things, whatever you're comfortable sharing. Sure, yeah. yeah. So on on YouTube, we're somewhere around 2.8 million on our main channel, mm -hmm. and then the we have five total channels, three. Three or over 100k. Yeah, uh, one of them is like a creator that we've grown. He was actually my initial garden assistant, and we like built a whole little mini content universe for him. Yeah, one of them is my own story of my homestead. So there's Epic Gardening, and then I created a sub brand called Epic Homesteading because I wanted a place to kind of just like f around at yeah. my house and make whatever content I wanted, and that yeah. started to do well. Uh, and then I think on every platform besides Facebook, we are the biggest account exclusively talks about gardening. Mm -hmm. So the, the botanical interests. Interest? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about this deal. Yeah, this one was crazy because the, the first seed pack I ever bought at a nursery, like with my brother way back when I was starting to grow, was one of their seed packs. Because yeah. it's this white packet with like hand-drawn illustrations mm -hmm. and it just stands out compared to the rest of the ones on the shelf. So I just picked it not knowing anything. Yeah. And then lo and behold, like 12 years later, we now own botanical interests. It's just yeah. a crazy story. But we went out and met them and... The founder is a founder, ex, a husband and wife founder, mm -hmm. and the husband's like, "Oh, like I know you. Like, let me grab a photo with you. Like, I've got a couple friends who are fans of your stuff." And I was yeah. like, "Okay, I think like we got a shot here. Like, yeah. we might be able to get this." Yeah. So he gave me the hat. Yeah. And the same hat you're wearing. The right same. Now. I have like 17 of these hats now, but <laughs> it might have been the same hat. Yeah. But um, I remember thinking to myself like this is probably going to be a competitive process. Like, there, I know there's like five to seven other people trying to purchase botanical interests, so. Mm. I'll just wear the hat 24-7 in every piece of content that, yeah. that I make yeah. until this deal is either won or lost. And I did. Like it's it, it, there's you can look from like all of 2022, I'm wearing the hat and everything. Mm -hmm. and I kind of still do. Um, and then we went through the whole bidding process for for buying the company. We were definitely not the highest bid, like verified mm -hmm. fact, by like a significant amount, like a meaningful amount for the founders take home on yeah. the sale. Yeah. We were not the highest. Yeah. And they still went with us. Mm -hmm. And so we go out to do like the whole celebration, closing party, that sort of thing. And Curtis, who's the one of the founders, he's like, you don't know how much wearing the hat made a difference. Wow. Uh, and I was like, I knew it. Yeah. Like I was like, I knew that would be yeah. that would make the difference. Because I love the brand. Like yeah. I was I was already a fan of the brand. Yeah. So I was like, what's a small thing I can do to show that I'm different than the other buyers who frankly yeah. probably would have just gutted the entire team and yeah. like done some roll up type thing. Yeah. You know, and, and I was also not gonna do that. So yeah. I think that helped. But how wearing yeah. a hat won me the biggest deal of my life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I texted my investors after and I was like, I want more equity back. Like, yeah. give me more, you know, because yeah. like, we saved quite a bit of money compared yeah. to what we would have had to go up to. So, so what yeah. was the angle there? I mean, it, get them to integrate with you guys, like the seeds, like you guys weren't doing any seeds. I don't know much no. about gardening, right? So no, no. So the, the product lines we had at the time and we still have are, it was raised beds. So like something, a container to grow plants in. And then we had a seed starting trays. So trays to start the seeds that we weren't offering, right? And we were purchasing from a, a local vendor um, connection that I had, very small player. And we were like, well, we need to get into other categories. And seed is a fantastic category to be in. It's, you know, it's something, it's, it's one of the few things you actually do have to purchase every year as a gardener. And not only do you have to, but you want to. Like these catalogs sit at your doorstep in the wintertime. You're like thumbing through the catalogs. You're circling all the seeds you want. You're making lists. You're like planting spreadsheets out and all this kind of stuff. It's like the most fun activity for a gardener. Mm. But we just weren't offering the seeds. And it's a very difficult business to build from scratch in any fast way at all. Because yeah. regulatory stuff, you know, the different connections you might have to have. Yeah. And so we're like, 
we we think we we should try to source source a business like this. So did you structure it like did you roll in equity or was it like upfront and earn out? They were they were out. They were okay. ready to go. Yeah. Okay, got it. They were like ready to retire. Oh, so it was like upfront. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were ready to there was you, you always do some sort of like holdback structure yeah, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. yeah, for the most part they were they were just ready to got it. be done. Yeah. You still talk to them? Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. If I have a question like I, I remember asking him a couple of weeks ago about some random password that yeah. I forgot, you know. Yeah. But they're friendly still. Yeah. So d- did he tell you like why the hat helped you win that deal? I think it's because uh, look, like if you're a founder operator and th- they built that company over twenty eight years, you know, and so your legacy is being passed on. And out of the people that were in the running to want to purchase it, obviously you have other equity com- private equity companies, and you have other mm-hmm. seed companies. Who does another seed company need the staff? No. And if you're a founder and you want to take care of your team, like you want to go to someone who is going to try to do right by them. And they're excited. The, the team. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and yeah. they're into it. Yeah. I, I would feel the same way. Like I was like, what play would work on me? Because yeah. that, that's what would work on me. You know? uh-huh, yeah. 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 That's poker play. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did you get into guarding in the first place? Because what, you're, you're six feet two, right? Six three, six four, six, three, something like okay. that. Yeah. So I, I don't see many six three, six four gardeners. So like, what? How did you get yeah. into it? Well, there's, there's not a lot of young gardeners in general now. Hopefully, there are more now. I got into it almost as like a desperation act to get off the computer. So I went to college. I went to University of California, Santa Barbara. Got an accounting degree. I was playing online poker during that time. Yeah. Because uh, I'm of the age where Chris Moneymaker won the World Series in 2004. I was about 16, 17 when that happened. And that got all of us starting to play poker. And like, that's all we did in high school. That's all we did, right? Yep, yeah, because yep. we're about the same age, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's all we did. So the second I turned 18, I put 100 bucks on, I think it was PokerRoom.net at the time, which is one of the OG sites. And I played Limit Poker, got decent at that. And then when No Limit came out, I played Full Tables. Then I played Six Max. Then I played Heads Up. Uh, then I was like VPNing into r- cra- crazy sites to like play French people because yeah. they were worse, you know? Yeah. And um, long story short, during college, I was doing well in poker, watching my friends sort of study for the accounting exams and just going, I'm making more than that now. And I never really craved to be an accountant. Mm-hmm. So after school, I played poker for a little bit, but I quit after about six months or so. Yeah. There was just nothing there for me afterwards. I had no clue what to do next. So I did some like small little business things, but I also started playing a ton of video games. Because if you play poker on the internet, it's very similar to video games. You just don't make money if you play mm-hmm. video games. Yeah. They're really good. Yeah. Um, so I got so obsessed with it that I was playing like eight to 10 hours a day. And so I started gardening with my brother one summer just to be out of the house. Just yeah. to just have a hobby that existed. Because I imagine you're probably on tilt like all the time. <laughs> oh yeah, especially if you're playing. You know, if yeah. you're playing poker and you're winning, yeah. losing, and you can't have that emotional control. Yeah. Like, I, I broke. You can a few. have winners tilt too. Yeah, yeah. you can. You yeah. can just be like on on a total high. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so okay, you start you start gardening, and then how does it start to become a thing? So I started gardening, and at the time, the little fledgling business I had was designing and building WordPress websites for like a local dentist, a local plumber, that kind of thing, and that was going. Okay. Like the first client I ever had, I think I charged 800 bucks to do a site. I didn't take any money up front. It was a guy who made like Letterman jackets in San Diego. And we got on the local news, we being my site, not, I had nothing to do with what I'm about to share, but he was just like doing drugs and not delivering (laughs) the Letterman jackets. And so my website gets on this news thing and I'm like, dude, this was just a terrible experience. Like I got maybe 400 bucks of the total 800. So I just wasn't doing that well. And I wasn't figuring stuff out. And, um, yeah, I mean, the, the blog was a way of, it, it, I built the blog as a way of, um, showing that I could build a website. Right. So I'd go to like a local client and be like, look, like, here's my little gardening blog. It's doing well on, on Google. Like I know this skill set. So it's like a digital business card. Yep. And so what, what was the inflection point? When did this thing start to take off? It took a long time. Cause from 2013, when I registered the domain to 2016, it was never the full-time thing. I was always doing other things. And when I came out of the only real job I had as an adult, which was at Scribe Media. I was the second employee there. I learned a ton, and then I came back to Epic, and 2016 was the first year I went Mm full-time. So I think when I quit, I was probably making like 400 bucks a month on the blog and YouTube. I don't even think YouTube was making any money then. So how did you know to go all in on this $400 a month thing? Yeah, I don't think I knew or didn't know. I think I just was going to do it and was going to see if it could work. Because my logic was... If I can get it to four hundred, I can probably get it to two or three thousand, yeah. and that's about as much as I spend. So yeah. theoretically, I could be that way forever, and right. I'd, I'd be free. You know, 
and, and plus you had an SEO background too, and a, now yeah. a, a writer background, right? Yeah, so. writing, SEO. Like I had the tools to build a website and, and market it and grow it, and then mm-hmm. I had the interest in gardening. Right. You know. Got it. And then so. One interesting, I, I think this kind of ties in with gardening too. We can take a little side quest here. So right now, like you're you're carving wood, right? So how do you yeah. have yeah. to find all these new habits? Like, that's, I mean, I think hobbies. that's that's like a, it's a strength and a weakness, right? Like all your all your great strengths become a weakness at some point. And so for me, like this in, insatiable curiosity about how how all things work, I'll get into a, a little side hobby or a side quest. And then this this whole carving wood thing came. One of the guys on my team, his name is Jacques. He's one of our creators. He got into it and he texted me and he was like, I just spent four hours carving wood. Like he made a spoon, you yeah, know? Yeah. And you can buy a spoon, but he made a spoon. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, cool. Let me grab some some of these like carving knives and this wood. I sit down with him. I spent four hours making a spoon. Didn't yeah. look at my phone. Yeah. It was just chatting, which is and then I left with the spoon, which was terrible spoon, but I left and I was like, oh, I feel so good right now. Like yeah. what's going on? You yeah. know? And so to me, it's just it's like a way to to get away from the business a little bit and just like have a thing that's pointless in a way. Yeah. It has, there's no point besides just doing it. It feels meditative. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Like this is like your version of like walking in the woods or just sitting there and doing nothing. Yeah. You got to have something like that. Right. Yeah. Cause I used to think like playing video games or like watching Netflix or like going out to eat or this or that was a way to de-stress, but it's, yeah. it's really not like it's yeah. still stimulation for the brain. Like yeah. you have to have a, present moment activity that like generally involves your yeah. body or hands or yeah. something with no no outcome yeah and and plus like i don't know if you're this way maybe just like a mid-30s thing now but i get a lot of anxiety just looking at my phone mm-hmm. and so like if, if, if the first hour of my day is like i have one hour screen time i already feel like a complete failure yeah and i just feel like i'm my brain scrambled how are you with that i'm okay at it i think because of the nature of creating on the internet and like being on YouTube, being on Instagram, being on TikTok, et cetera. How, part of how I built those platforms was just responding to every comment, no matter what. So mm-hmm. up until like 2019, I think I responded to every comment on every platform. So I got really used to like multi-threading. Yeah. And then when you played poker back in the day, like yeah. I don't know if you played online, yeah. but I would play 10, 12 tables at a time yeah. and you're making like many decisions yeah. per minute on those tables. Yeah. So my brain can handle it. But I think when you get to your mid-30s, mm-hmm. you're, you, just because you can't handle it doesn't mean you like should or want to. Right. And so I kind of feel the same way these days. I wanted to take a second to talk about today's spot. Sponsor Ahrefs. Ahrefs is my favorite SEO tool. In fact, we use it at my ad agency, Single Grain, for internal uses and also for clients, and we've been using it for years and years. And the cool thing is they have a great academy that you can go to if you're looking to just learn SEO. And they have a free offering if you just search for ahrefs.com slash webmaster dash tools. My favorite feature with Ahrefs, it's a sneaky feature here, but I'm just looking at zapier.com. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at, oh, wow, they, they got 10 million visits in the last, I don't know, six months or so compared to the previous six months. Months. Well, okay, how are they doing it? I can look at their site structure. So if I click on site structure, I can see that their blog has driven the vast majority of it and it was a five million, a plus five million change, right? So basically what I can do is I can look at the pages that are driving that traffic. And now I have a sense for what they're doing in terms of strategy. So I can look at competitors. I can also look at our own stuff too, to figure out how we can optimize our own website. So you can just check out Ahrefs Webmaster Tools. That's completely free. Or you can go to the Ahrefs Academy. That's also free as well to learn more. And that being said, back to the video. Six years of commenting. So I, I want to come over to YouTube because you, again, you have a 2.8 million sub channel, 350, mm-hmm. 350. Yeah. Was, and the, like the other two are sub 10K. They're, okay. they're, they're sort of starting out. And you just started a new channel and then boom, I see a couple hundred thousand views on one oh, video. Oh, the personal channel. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So what is this, what's like your formula? Because now it's just a formula. It's not even a secret. Like what mm-hmm. is it that works for you? It's, I think it's channel dependent. So like on the, on the main channel, Epic Gardening, a lot of it is just educational how-to videos that that play over many, many, many years. So like some of the early stuff still does really well. How to prune basil so it grows forever. Uh, pruning tomatoes 101, everything you need to know, right? Like that's going to be searched for many, many years. And yeah, your ability to host, your ability to explain the information, that all helps a lot. But it's a, it's a search-based strategy, which is kind of like oldish school YouTube. The new channels, Epic Homesteading specifically, it's more of like a for the fans type channel and it plays and recommends. It, it's really, like I'm not titling something based on SEO. Mm-hmm. I'll title something like, I can't believe this happened. you yeah. know, And then the thumb will have like my chicken flying the coop or something right. like that. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting based on what, what plat- 
right. what channel it is, like the strategy is different. I think it's also a combination, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's it's one, you know the game of YouTube, but also there just isn't a lot of content being created around gardening, even today, right? Yeah, I mean, I would say there there is, but it's just a smaller space than mm-hmm. fitness or f- certainly food. Like I just came from this big food blog conference and it's like 97 food bloggers and like me, someone who does a Disney Thing yeah. And somebody does a country thing. Like it's yeah. it's such a huge world, you yeah. know. Gardening's not that not that big. And how does that YouTube engine help with your business? Like, what do you, do you have a sense for how much percent it drives? Yeah. So we try to we try to crack this because if you could fully crack attribution, you'd probably be like the richest person on the internet, mm-hmm. right? But we know that direct attributed revenue from all the organic platforms that we have is somewhere in the eight to ten percent range. But that's like the look lowest you could possibly track. It's like the one day click, 24 hour window, like all that kind of stuff. So you got to imagine if if you've got direct traffic coming in from like uh, sources that are harder to track, like where else are they going to hear about us from, you know? Right. And we don't spend a ton of money on paid ads. So yeah. it's it's a good chunk. Got it. So what what are the kind of distribution engines for you guys right now? YouTube, yeah. SEO? Yeah, so the blog is really how the whole thing started. The blog is a tank now because mm-hmm. We've grown it many, many times over the years. But we also have made a couple blog acquisitions and folded them into mm. our blog. Um, and then YouTube, the short form platforms, which I would consider like Instagram, TikTok, Facebook to some degree, and even YouTube Shorts, we don't use that too mm. much. Those to me all function as like top of funnel organic reach for more organic content. Mm-hmm. So like I kind of want you to see that stuff, go like, oh, I might want to grow some herbs or something, yeah. and then go to YouTube. And then from there, you might go, I want to grow herbs with a system that that we offer, and then mm-hmm. you might go buy it. Got it. Yeah. And so it seems like you use TikTok, Instagram Reels, but how come you don't touch YouTube Shorts? I do use it, but mm-hmm. the way I use it right now, at least, is of the four Shorts platforms that exist, TikTok to me seems the most uh, the most throwaway in mm-hmm. the sense of like its impact is not super strong. And so I'll test every piece of short form on TikTok. If it does well there, I'll escalate it to IG, where we have a more dedicated and like long-term fan base. Mm. And then I'll put it on Facebook. If those also do well, now I have three data points. This is what I call like a cross-platform banger. Yeah. And if I have a cross-platform banger, it'll go to YouTube. Because YouTube is the most precious audience yeah. that I think we have. CPB, cross-platform so yeah, CPB banger. CPB strategy. Oh, yeah, I like you that. heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Uh, we, we can jump around here, but you just mentioned the word, uh, the phrase blog acquisition. So can you mm-hmm. speak more to that? Because I think a lot of people would like to learn. Yeah, so the yeah. early, the earliest one I did was 2017. I was writing almost exclusively about edible stuff and hydroponics. So edible gardening, hydroponics. I wanted to get into some houseplant stuff because I was starting to grow houseplants a lot at that point in time. Like there was a big houseplant craze in the mid, late 2010s. Yeah, And so I found this website that I was using just to research potential articles to write. And then I was like, this is a pretty decent site, but it looked old, like it looked unmaintained. I'm talking like early 2000s style level design. So I did a who is search on it and I did a little SEO research. It was getting like 30, 35,000 hits a month. Mm -hmm. I do a who is search. It's some like Indian guy and he was a VC in Mm -hmm. India. Mm -hmm. I find his Twitter and I go, hey, do you own this site? He's like, oh yeah, I actually forgot about that site. I'm like, would you you ever want to sell it? And he's like, yeah, I'll sell it to you for $10 an article, which there was 90 articles, so Mm -hmm. $900. Mm -hmm. And I was doing the He's math. He's not the writer, right? It's just one of his sites. He may have been. I have no idea, honestly. A VC that just... <laughs> yeah, I mean, who knows what VC meant back yeah, then. I, mean, I have yeah, no idea. Yeah. But it, may, it was probably just some like AdSense project that he did, he did back in the day, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But anyway, so I, I bought it for, for 900 bucks. Just at 900 on the ad rev, you would earn just on display ads at a one-to-one, like assuming no traffic mm-hmm. increase. I was like, this thing pays off in like four months. So it's yeah. just like an auto buy. Yeah. So I bought it. I'd spent like a couple days transferring all the articles over, 301 redirecting them. I think just because my domain authority was higher, the rankings were better, right? Mm-hmm. And so then we... Oh, so you moved the articles over. I, I rewrote them from scratch yeah. and just redirected Got it. the URL to URL, Got it. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, it, it contributed like 80,000, 90,000 hits a month to the blog for at a off. higher yeah. you know, RPM. And so yeah. it paid off in like two months. Um, yeah, you don't hear many people talking about, so you hear people buying blogs and they have the you know, strong domain authority, they might have some articles, um, but buying the blog just for the content, not many people do that. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's the first one that you did. It, it starts adding, what, 80, 90,000 visitors per month? Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah, it was, it yeah. was a ton, right? And yeah. it was it was 
it gave me an entire category within my major category of gardening of, yeah. of houseplants, right? Yeah. Then I could partner those with the YouTube videos that yeah. I was making at the time. And then we've made uh, we made a much larger blog acquisition last year mm -hmm. where I was hiring for a director of search role because I was really I was already hands off on the blog, but I, I needed someone who was really good at SEO because mm -hmm. uh, it was such a tank for us. Yeah. Um, and this guy messaged me, this guy Jason, he's like, hey, look, I'm interested in the job, but I have been building a gardening website over the last like 15 to 18 months. Uh -huh. And he was crushing, like just crushing traffic. And I had to make sure it was all legit and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. And I was like, well, instead of just working here, you kind of can't be our director of SEO and be running a gardening blog that yeah. isn't ours, right? Yeah. So what if we purchased your blog and hired you? Mm -hmm. So we did that and we were roughly one-to-one -one traffic. So mm -hmm. we were probably at 10 million uniques a year. He was probably at 10 million. And we just completed about six months ago folding those That's blogs tough. together. Yeah. It was very difficult. Yeah. But what ended up happening was it's the same thing, just at a bigger scale. So say our average position was like anywhere from like 10 to 11 across all of our keyword positions. The addition of his redirects on our higher domain authority yeah. plus the additional content itself, wow. our average position is like seven to eight now. Wow. Just so everyone knows, what, what Kevin's talking about, average position is average like ranking per Yeah, search order. ranking position. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty significant. It was crazy. And then yeah. the wilder thing too is we're on, um, we use a ad network like a Media Vine, we use Raptive, mm -hmm. and he was in a larger tier than we were because his traffic was like just slightly higher than ours. So by virtue of purchasing his site, our RPM almost doubled on mm -hmm. our site. So if you think about that, as far as like the yeah. payback of the acquisition, it was just crazy. Yeah, it was it was another sort of slam dunk play. That's interesting. So why didn't he just decide to continue on his? Like why why did he uh, he didn't tap out? But why did he? So. Yeah, I mean he he tapped in. I guess you could say. Yeah. So he got to realize some exit value, right? Mm -hmm. And he got equity in Epic, which mm -hmm. is great. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, we yeah, gave yeah. him some equity in Epic, yeah. and yeah. then also he was just never going to do the commerce piece of the business, which mm -hmm. is like. 95% of our yeah. revenue. And so he's like, I'd rather be on the team he that I think is going to win long term. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. So how did you, whatever you can reveal here, how did you structure this room just in case someone wants to do the same thing? I think this is where it gets the most interesting, right? Because I can't say the exact details of his particular deal, but mm -hmm. we were able to structure it in a way that was favorable for both of us. Like he mm -hmm. has he has a payout, but he has additional monies coming in. And then because we were employing him, we could bake some of the deal into like a salary structure as well. Right. But you could probably try to do like full on seller financing for some of these if mm -hmm. a blog owner is like willing to make that bet, yeah. you know. So you gave him an upfront and then mm -hmm. some equity. Yeah, upfront, like, some equity, yeah. salary, some some over time. It was it was kind of a mix okay. of all the ways that you could do it. Is he happy? Yeah, he loves it. Yeah, yeah, he's really happy. That's here. great. This is like an aqua hire. That's that is a slam dunk deal. It's so like a one off aqua hire. You yeah, know? yeah. How did you, and he was the only employee, right? Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. how did you? I don't want to say how you sourced this, but yeah, how did you go about finding this deal? He came to me. Yeah, on this particular one, he came to me because we. I've been in SEO for such a long time mm -hmm. that we knew each other from just various circles or forums or whatever. Yeah. You know, there's only so many gardening SEOs. There's so, not that many, right? Yeah. And so. Epic was already a pretty sizable gardening blog at the time, and so I think he just was plugged into who was in the space. You Got know? it. Yeah. Where do you think SEO is going? By the way, I mean, you know, the big update this week, right? There's yeah. a ton of sites getting de-indexed, clapped. Yeah, They're getting clapped. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. I mean, I remember when um, when OpenAI first came out with ChatGPT, I was like, "What's your what's your position, Jason, on on using AI?" And he's like, "Yeah, it's just not for me." And I felt the same way. I was like, "I I I don't think it's at a point where." It would even make sense to use it at all to help the writing, and yeah. we've never used it. And mm -hmm. we also never we didn't get hit by the helpful content update. Yeah, we haven't gotten hit in this. We just don't use it. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, man. I mean, Google's rolling out search generative experience. They're doing all that kind of stuff. I don't even think they know where yeah. it's going. To be yeah. honest, yeah. Well, I, and again, you guys are what twenty million visitors per month, per year, or we're probably tracking to like the goal this year is like forty forty five. Okay, um, Got it. like thirty ish probably this Got last, it. this past year. Yeah. Got it. Um, and so I like that. So your site purely, there's no AI assisted content. There's no programmatic SEO. There's none yeah, of that. There's, there's zero, which yeah. who knows, maybe we're leaving something on the table, but I'd rather just not take the chance. Better safe than sorry. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So you, you guys are averaging like oh, around like 3.7 million visit visitors per month. Yeah. Seasonally um, curved though, cause it's yeah. gardening. So it's very seasonal. So down during winter time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and how big is email for you guys? I mean, on the three point seven, pretty it's big. Huge, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, email's pretty big. Um, my biggest mistake, probably early on with the blog, is I just didn't care about email because I was on YouTube and podcasts and stuff. Yeah. So when I started doing ecom in twenty nineteen, that's when I started doing email because you're it. auto capturing it from Shopify. You know. Got it. Um, and what is that? 
what percent of your revenue comes from email, you think? Of from email directly? I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. The reason I ask yeah. that is because like so many people don't respect email. Mm-hmm. And in some cases, sometimes it's like twenty to forty percent of their business comes it from email. It should be. Yeah. yeah. I think it should yeah. be for like a for just like a standard D2C style business, mm-hmm. you'd really would want it to be upwards of 20% for sure. Yep. Uh, for us, it started out near zero, and now our list is pretty large, and mm-hmm. we, we drive a considerable amount from it, yeah. Got it. And how well do your visitors convert to email? Like, Do you have a sense? It's tough because the site started with a blog, right? Mm-hmm. And so when I started e-com, I ran that on a subdomain, so shop.epicgardening.com, which yeah. is on Shopify. So yeah. you effectively have two different funnels to gain emails, mm-hmm. and you also have two different sort of intents. Like if you're coming in cold from SEO on how to prune your hydrangeas versus yeah. like you're landing on the store, it's a very different yeah. thing. But different we, intent. we're getting like, I think right now it's like, Two to four percent opt-in on the blog, yeah. so, something like that. But we're testing opt-ins like all yeah. the time to try to come up with something. That, that's where I'm going with it. Yeah. So, like our the um, survival site that I have. Um, so we haven't changed the offer in years. It's well, just like a target, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so for you guys, you said it sounds like you're testing the offer all the time, right? Because you got to keep the conversion rate high. two to four percent is pretty good. Yeah, it's decent on cold traffic. Yeah. So, how often are you testing the offers? And like, what are some examples of the offers? So on the commerce side, we'll just test really basic things like five versus ten percent off your first order, mm. or free shipping on yep. your first order instead of have there being a free free shipping threshold. On the blog, we are testing right now like rolling monthly giveaways because we have a whole suite of products that we develop now, right? And so right. let's say we have a new launch coming out in April, and we're going to test just giving out a fully built out kit of that particular product. Mm-hmm. It's probably like two ish thousand dollar value. Yeah. The problem is like that opt-in rate is higher, but the incent of a giveaway makes the average right. subscriber lower, lower yeah, right? Yeah. And so it's always a trade-off, but that's what we're working on right now. Got it. By the way, Neil and I have an agency owners group called the Agency Owners Association. All you have to do, just go to marketingschool.io slash agency. Once again, it's marketingschool.io slash agency to learn more. And now back to the show. You know, at lunch, we talked about this concept of creator operators, right? Mm -hmm. So what percentage of your time goes towards creating versus your business? These days, it's a lot more towards creating again, which is great. And creating these days is content and product. So I spend a lot of time testing product, ideating on product, researching, mm-hmm. et cetera. Because that is really how the business works now. I mean, 90 plus percent of our revenue is, is coming from product, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I would say in the early 2022, 2023, it was a lot more on pure ops because I was having to hire up and we were making acquisitions. We purchased the seed company, which was like a very large acquisition. Mm-hmm. Um, and it took up so much time, just like the people management, the yeah. operations. But we hired a president, um, probably about nine months ago mm-hmm. now, uh, who has taken so much of that off back off my plate and I can yeah. go back to kind of the stuff that I used to do. Got it. So, okay, this is interesting. So obviously, if we're talking about scaling here, you know, you've, you've picked up some some cash from private equity. They want you to grow. Um, this president, like what's the prototype here? Like, you know, did they have like this crazy gardening background? <laughs> like, No, he's he's really into gardening now. Yeah. Um, but he didn't have like a wild gardening background, but he was at Procter & Gamble back in the day. Mm-hmm. He was at Amazon. He launched Amazon Pantry yeah. when it was, I think that that's different than Fresh, but he launched Pantry for a while. Uh, and then he was the ex-chief growth officer at GameStop mm. before and during the Got wild it. rise. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he has some cool stories from that. Got but yeah, it. he's just seen a lot of different environments and he wanted an opportunity to work at something a little bit smaller, which it's funny because for me, like yeah. our scale of business is the biggest thing I've ever built. For him, yeah. it's a smaller opportunity, you yeah. know. So So yeah. like he really I mean, you guys kind of went from this um it was like this blog, this almost like this media property over into creating your own products, right? And then mm-hmm. he has a lot of experience doing that. So even yeah. though he doesn't have like one to one gardening experience, he does have a lot of experience like Building products and that's building what you products, needed. scaling teams. Yeah, because yeah, I can handle the gardening product side, and we have a we have a product development team who's mm-hmm. directly experienced in the garden space. And so, yeah, we needed someone who was like the operations guru. Got it. Yeah. How, how did you find the guy? Oh man, we just went on like a crazy search. Like we used recruiters and networks and mm-hmm. talked to like tons and tons of people. Yeah, it's just hard to find that type of fit. You know, yeah. was executive search firm. Yeah, we used we used one of those. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So was that the one that worked out? That or? was the one that worked out. Yeah, we yeah. used like two. We tried like two or three, and then we yeah. finally came up with one that worked. You pay a fat percentage on those, but it's worth it at the end of the day. That's what I've learned. Wh- whether yeah. you're recruiting or whether you're hiring, like 
paying the X percent more, but if you know for a fact you're getting a yeah. 10X talent, it's it's yeah. it's obviously free. Did you yeah. feel that? Like this is a 10X, this is like a F yes? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I felt that. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. got it. Um, and let's go back to, so, you know, Obviously, private equity, you know, they're putting money in, but they want the investment to 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 work out, right? Mm-hmm. So, how how have they been helpful to you? Well, I mean, so the Churning Group is our investors, and they've got the exact background of the type of company I was already on the path to building, right? It's this content to commerce sort of model, mm-hmm. and so for for me, you look at like Meat Eater, one of their investments, Barstool Sports, mm-hmm. Food Fifty Two. Hodinky, it's all these properties that were built by like a passionate founder who either started to transition to commerce or via you know their their help started to transition to commerce so I was like there's no better partner that understands the space of taking media and bringing it to like a completely built out end to end commerce business got it yeah and so what um have they helped you with the executive recruiting process like what else have they yeah done? i mean i think yeah. the biggest the biggest help is is like the speed at which you can learn mm-hmm. uh, as a founder by having people helping you with all these different things that I, I'm not exposed to that type of world. Like I grew up in San Diego, I was playing poker, you know, I was doing yeah. SEO by yeah. myself, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so the the world of of people with all these like very very high level skills that you can learn from really quickly was super helpful. And I think just doing the acquisition, like the major acquisition we made, which was of this company, Botanical mm-hmm. Interests, our, our mm-hmm. seed company. Yeah. I could not like not, not only did I not have the capital to do yeah. it, but I couldn't have even done the diligence myself. Yeah. Like it's just so complex. You do know? they help you? I mean, do you just like email them and you're like, hey, I need help structuring this, or hey, I need this. You can, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. if you if if you need to, you can, or you yeah. can you can bounce off. You have a board now, right? Yeah. And you got board advisors and stuff. And you yeah. just ask them. Yeah, got it. And how how many people are on your board? It's only three right now. You, and yeah, two, me and two, two of, of the other directors. Okay. Yeah, but we need to we need to build it out a little bit more. <laughs> Got it. Interesting. So l- let's go back to I want to jump around here. So p- poker. Why should everyone consider playing poker? Man, these days I don't even know if they should. But back in the day, because you played right, like you remember the glory days of poker. It was mm-hmm. kind of easy. I think we're both least. DJs. Yeah, I was multi tabling. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it was kind of it was definitely easier back then. But yeah. the the beauty I think of poker is it's like a microcosm of business for sure because mm-hmm. you have real stakes. Like you have a buy in, you're playing. There's a game type, so there's a rules to the game type of thing going on, and then it's a game of imperfect information. Like you know what you have, and I know. Let's say I'm playing you heads up. Like I know your personality over a hundred hands. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll start to understand. Like oh, I can tell he's acting faster on the yeah. flop turn and river. He's yeah. he, and he's also losing. Yeah. He might be more mad. Yeah. Right now, he might Pattern be on recognition. Tell. You know what I mean? So yeah. you start recognizing weird patterns. Like I remember be playing six max tables, so six people to a table, no limit hold them. And over, let's say you're playing a table for a couple hours, you can tell just by how quickly someone does or doesn't react and how you know they've been doing over the last hour or two, mm-hmm. whether where their emotional state. Yeah. And they're nothing more than an avatar and, and a pattern of clicking. Yeah. And you can yeah. actually pinpoint that to like how yeah. they're actually feeling. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, it teaches you a lot about decision making with real stakes in real time, which is kind of what business is. Yeah. Maybe maybe I should have rephrased the question, like why should all entrepreneurs play poker? Because there's actually more entrepreneurs now playing poker. I don't know if you've seen that trend. I don't know. I have because when yeah. I quit poker, I like straight up quit. I, yeah. I barely ever played ever since. Yeah. And that was 20 uh, f- 2010. Yeah. So I don't even know what the scene is like these days. Because business is the best game. It is. It yeah, is. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. better. I'm definitely better at business than I than I was at poker for sure. How how, how much were, how do, how much do you think you were making a year playing poker? I, we're both in college, right? So yeah, I think the I think if I summed up everything I ever made from poker, it was probably two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollars yeah. total. So not like certainly like killing it for mm-hmm. college, and I was able to pay for school and stuff. Yeah. But I was I know friends who were making millions. It was crazy. Yeah. So we're, we're like the same. We're like pretty good, but we're not like top one percent of the one percent. I was yeah. not top one percent, and yeah. you know what it was for me. I'm curious what it was for you. My yeah. emotional control of going on tilt if I yeah. was losing, yeah, and I was too um, too passive when I was winning. So I wasn't going for it when I was winning, and I was I would get mad when I lost, and that yeah. was mostly why I, I had, didn't have as big of an edge as I could. Yeah, I, I think it's a downward spiral thing. Yeah. It's it's like learning to control your emotions, definitely for for me, and. Doing too many things at once too, so mm-hmm. I might have tournaments going while I had cash games going at the same time, and I might be playing PLO in another one. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I couldn't do that. Yeah, yeah, I could only play one type of game at once for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, 
So I, I just find it interesting. There's a lot more VCs playing now. Um, there's a lot more entrepreneurs playing now. There's like these underground games in, in really? LA, right? Yeah. Actually, my, my neighbor where I live, I hear chips shuffling all the time. <laughs> like yesterday, I was walking back to my house. I'm like, God, this guy just this guy just play poker all you day. You got to hop in on one of those secret oh, games. I'm, I'm going to knock it one day and say, hey, I'm in. Yeah, so, just buy in right there. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Actually, there's some pretty crazy games that happened there from, from what I heard. But anyway, um, how about, so you're... I mean, look, you've gotten into mold toxicity. Talk about that. Yeah, well, dude, I, I got into like the esoteric health side of, of Twitter, now X, and it's pretty wild. Like the people on there, I don't understand what's going on in their minds, but they're going into this world of like everything that was ever recommended when they were a child is like d- default bad, right? So like every single thing that modern medicine says is is terrible. So I definitely don't think that's that great. But um, the mold stuff does seem to be a real thing. It does seem to be a problem. It seems like one-fifth of people don't have the gene, either it's on or off, I forgot which one, to to like adequately clear mycotoxins from their body. And by the way, I'm like not a doctor. I'm just like very early at learning this. But I th- I did the test and I have the gene. And so, where you can't filter it, where I can't get it out of my body as quickly as mm-hmm. four fifths of people, because uh, one in five is like that's a lot of people. That's twenty yeah. percent of of all people. And um, I started looking at it, and then I was doing blood tests and this and that, uh, just for different reasons. And it all started to line up. That I'm like, you know, I remember when I was first building Epic, I was renting this place, and it was leaking all the time, and I would have to take naps like once a day. And I was never a napper before. I'm like, why am I so out of it? Mm. Um, and that's gone in waves. Like, I think it kind of maps to stress and, you know, all the stuff that kind of comes with being a entrepreneur. Uh, but I started looking, I was like, it can't just be that. Like, there's gotta be some biological thing going on. So I don't know if I have it or not, but I had a fridge leaking for a while and I think that might be something to do with it. I don't know. I'm yeah. just looking into it. So, so what test did you, did you run? It's called the HLA Gene test, I think. Okay. Yeah, the gene's called HLA. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it just says like what? Like you're too high on it, too low. I think it says if you if it's active or not. I forgot. I honestly forgot. But there's there's like a whole panel I got. It was like 20 different tests. Yeah. And they all lined up. I did like a urine mycotoxin yeah. test. So I like peed in a cup. Yeah. And I had one particular mycotoxin was like 10 times the normal range, mm-hmm. which as far as I understand it would not happen if I yeah. could clear it quickly. You yeah. know, you know, this is all interesting. It, it all kind of ties together because like, we go from gardening to wood carving to mold toxicity, right? <laughs> it's like, I, I don't want to even call it a distraction, but I'll, I'll just use it as a word because it's like, it, it is distracting yourself from distractions in real life. Mm-hmm. And so I, I guess what I'm really wondering is when you start getting into gardening or carving wood like how many hours are you spending per day or per week on this stuff D- doing that stuff i mean i yeah. might just like make a couple carvings on the weekend you know like yeah. especially if there's a friend who wants to join because then yeah. you're just having a conversation with a friend you're just like yeah. it's just whittling basically yeah. um gardening is tough because i got into gardening like i said to get off the computer and stop playing video games yeah never thought i'd become a thing yeah uh, but then fell in love with it but then built a business based on it, which yeah. means that the act of gardening is now work and it's mm-hmm. no longer play. Yeah. And so does it feel that way? It feels like you're having fun. I am having fun, yeah. but it's a different type of fun than just like someone who watches us, right? Someone who watches us might just be gardening with their family on the weekends and that's right. how they engage with it. Yeah. And it's the way I engage with the whittling yeah. now. Right. So yeah. I had to come up with yet another thing to kind of make sure that yeah. I still had a hobby like that. Got it. Yeah. So you're, you're home. Do you have like a shitload of plants? Like what's the oh, deal? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, all the content still comes out of the house. Yeah. So I bought a place in 2020, like in May. So right before the crazy run up of real estate, mm-hmm. it was a third of an acre, small ass house, but um, about 12,000 square feet of just like an empty yeah. lot. Yeah. And so over the, the, th- the three years that have come after that, I built it out. Yeah. And yeah, that, that's where the story of Epic Homesteading came. I started yeah. that channel I think right when I bought the house yeah. and did like a house tour as my first video, yeah. started with like 30,000 subs and then boom, here we go with, yeah. with the story. So yeah, all the content comes from the house. What, what is, I don't even know what homesteading means. A lot of people don't. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to kind of redefine it as to mean like being a producer of something that you consume instead mm-hmm. of just consuming everything, you know? Yeah. So at my place, like I have 25 fruit trees. I have, uh, about 7,000 gallons worth of rainwater capture and wow. just in a normal suburban home. And I live in San Diego. Yeah. So how, rain's my, actually How big scarce. is your place? The house is only on a third of an acre. Okay. So it's like 12,000 square foot lot. It's yeah. not It's not that big. Yeah. And that's kind of the point. I want to show that you can do this stuff in like a normal mm-hmm. person's house. Got it. Yeah. So, okay. Like, let's say 
for example, I'm lazy. So how, how should a lazy person think about gardening if they want to get into it? Lazy person gardening, I would say just grow like fruit trees then. Yeah. You know, because once they get set up, they just produce every year. You do a little bit of pruning like once or twice a year, and that's pretty much all yeah. you have to do. Yeah. I'm just like, what about all the pests? What about all this? What about that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say grow like here in LA, just grow citrus. You'd be fine. Yeah. Just grow like two of your favorite citrus trees. Why citrus? Because it grows really well in, in California, uh-huh. number one. And I don't know anyone who doesn't like it. Yeah. And it doesn't have too many pests that you have to deal with. Yeah. I'm like, does the like sourness like repel the pests or whatever? No, like there's actually a really bad citrus disease called citrus greening. It's like wiped out all of Florida's citrus. There's a a little bug called the Asian citrus psyllid, which creates this disease. The called, Asian one? Yeah, it's an Asian one. Damn. Yeah. Yet we, another. We don't right? do, yeah. You know, we're we not, do a we're lot not, of damage. We're not doing that well with the diseases, <laughs> yeah. us Asians, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, it creates a disease called Huang Long Bing. Okay. Which is also yeah. called citrus greening and it like destroys citrus trees and there's no cure. Yeah. Uh, and so Florida citrus is like totally wiped out. Like if you try to go buy a, a citrus tree online, you will only be able to get it from a place close to where you already are. You won't be able to ship it in or out usually what just because heck? this disease is so pervasive. Oh yeah. my God. Okay. Yeah, there's a war for citrus right now. No one knows about it. No. Yeah. Maybe that's why it's so hard to order oranges in Florida. Yeah. Oranges I, in I, Florida I lived there for two years. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 That's interesting. All right, quick note. This is about my company. It's called Single Grain. And Single Grain is an ad agency where we're focused on driving innovation. And so I want to talk about a couple of new strategies. And if you need help with marketing, great. If not, here are a couple of new strategies that you should try out. One is programmatic CRO. So we are doing programmatic conversion rate optimization on our site. We're building products that will automatically optimize your site to increase conversion rates. We're also auto-optimizing, auto-updating uh, from a, from an SEO standpoint, and we're constantly thinking about what else we can do in terms of enriching the visitors that are hitting your website, and also tailoring custom messages for them using AI. And so there's a handful of things that we're doing from a marketing standpoint, and our mission is just to drive more innovation. So if you want to learn more, just go to singlegrain.com, grain like rice. So singlegrain.com to learn more, and we'll see you inside. What else should people know about gardening? Inter- I, I'm fascinated because it's like it's like learning tennis or learning like pickleball or something, right? It's mm-hmm. like, what, what else would I not know? <laughs> about gardening itself? High level. High level? I mean, I would say... Um, if I wanted to get into it, right? Like you just said, for example, like you should have a citrus tree. Like mm-hmm. what's a beginner's way of getting into it? That's maybe a that's beginner's it. way would be picking the thing you really love to eat the most. Like what is a vegetable that you enjoy? Vegetable? Mm, like, broccoli. No, I broccoli. I okay, broccoli is yeah, a good one. Yeah. So then then just, just grow that mm-hmm. in the first year. Because what I noticed is there's plants that are easier and harder to grow. Like radishes are super easy to grow or yeah. turnips are super easy to grow. But yeah. like I don't know a lot of people who are obsessed with radishes and turnips. Yeah. You know, so pick something you like to eat and just grow that in a pot. Yeah. For the first season, yeah, and, and just see if you enjoy it. The reason I'm asking you this question too is like, yeah. how do you translate this into like now you're like, okay, now I'm acquiring other businesses. Now I'm, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. How do, how can people practice the learning muscle of gardening and then carry it over into business? You know what? There's so many weird connections I think between gardening or the natural world and and the world of business. Like just just the whole idea of compounding, right? Like because when a, when a seed comes out of the ground, there's something called um, cotyledons. They're the two leaves that come out first and they don't look like other leaves. So if you were to grow a cucumber, what's a leaf that most people know? Most people know what like a strawberry leaf looks Mm -hmm. like, right? Like strawberry leaf comes out. The first two don't look like strawberry leaves because they were actually in the seed at the outset of planting. Like they were already inside. And then the next two that come are the actual strawberry leaves or the cucumber leaves or the bean leaves or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then from there, what's happening is, is the the plant is taking in sunlight, it's photosynthesizing, generating chlorophyll, generating energy, using resources from the roots to create more leafy growth, to take more of that energy in, to redo that whole process. And then eventually it'll produce usually like what botanically is called a fruit. So like a tomato would be a fruit mm-hmm. on the plant. But to me, it's crazy to watch because it's it's very much similar to how like a blog might grow. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you write one article and then you try to get a little traffic to it, and someone might link to that, which might give you more traffic, right? And it, it just yeah. compounds in the same way. Yeah. So there's a lot of different weird parallels, I think, when I walk out in the garden, I go like, oh, it kind of reminds me of this theory from business, yeah. you know? Same thing with poker, too. I mean, same thing with everything, I guess. <laughs> everything you yeah. can relate, right? Yeah. The interconnectedness of all things. Yeah. Yeah, at lunch, you made a good, so maybe explain this analogy around asparagus and long-term thinking. 
Yeah, asparagus is, is you got to have some patience for that one. So asparagus is a plant that grows from what are called crowns. And, and you plant the crowns underground and they'll put up asparagus spears, like the thing you see at the grocery store. But in the first year, if you let that spear grow, it grows into an asparagus fern. So the leaf part of, of the asparagus plant, which then, of course, generates energy. And as the asparagus dies back for the season, it'll develop underground. Like a lot of that energy is really being shunted underground. It's developing that network underground. So the next year, more spears come up. And if you don't harvest those and let those generate energy, it'll do the same thing. So by year three or so, enough spears have come up that you can take some. And so you kind of have to let it compound for a couple of years before you can really start harvesting without damaging the plant. Mm -hmm. But if you do that, asparagus is a plant that grows for like 30 years. Yeah. And so it's it's a very interesting parable. And you think about this in like the whole creator operator world of people, I'm sure you know, who are making good money year to year, but they're taking out 80% of profits from the business and they're not reinvesting. Mm -hmm. And then like year four comes along and some weird algorithm thing happens or whatever, or something catastrophic yeah. and they're just gone, right? Yeah. And they've got no way to to build back. They just yep. have to restart on something else. Yep. Yeah. What does Warren Buffett say? Never interrupt compounding unnecessarily or maybe Charlie Munger. I think that. it was Munger that said it, but yeah. it's, it's right. Yeah. It's definitely right. Yeah. yeah. If you can avoid it. What What's your relation? So like, you know, we're at this investor conference. Like what, what's, how are you a student of investing in general? Yeah, so I, I got into that because around 2014, 2015, when I was, I'd raised money to do like this relationship app startup mm -hmm. and it just didn't work out. And I was kind of down in the dumps and trying to figure out like, why is everything I'm doing just like not making it? You know, I can do enough to survive and I'm not like yeah. killing it. And so I started studying mental models back then. I don't know if you remember, there was this blog called Farnham Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's like, I think right around yeah. the time that Shane Parrish started Farnham Street. Yeah. So I started reading that. I started reading this guy, Eric Jorgensen's uh, Medium page called Evergreen Library. At oh, the I time. didn't even know he had a Medium. He had a Medium way back yeah, in the day. Yeah. And, and that's how I met Eric. And then I kind of got into all these mental models and I bought Poor Charlie's Almanac mm -hmm. and I read that. And then I started trying to go like, okay, well, what are all the models in biology? What are all the models in physics? What are all the models in electromagnetism, whatever? Mm -hmm. And then I was just going, well, how does that relate to what I'm trying to do? And it, it helped me start to think from the ground up. Like Elon will say, like first principles thinking type mm -hmm. stuff. And I started to go, oh, that's why that wasn't working. Oh, I wasn't solving the right problem, right? And so to me, not so much like getting into it because of investing, even though we were at that conference, because yeah. I was more of an operator at that conference and mm -hmm. most people were investors. Mm -hmm. um, but but you can, obviously you can use the same principles to build a business too. Yeah, that's the way you got unstuck was you just, you started to study first mental models and then you started studying models across all these different disciplines, mm -hmm. physics, math, everything. Mm -hmm. why, why go into physics, math, like... So the, the I, figured, I figured like the mental models would be good enough on their own, right? Yeah, so, well, they all come from those yeah. those those fields, right? Yeah. So like physics is a great one to study because it's pretty much the baseline science of our universe, and mm -hmm. so there's nothing really underneath it, unless I guess you get into meso metaphysics. But yeah. I wasn't doing that, so yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, if you learn if you learn some of those basic physics principles, then it it helps you sort of reason, or just like from poker days, right? Like. Prob probability theory is, I think, very helpful. Game theory. Or, uh, game theory is yeah. super helpful. Yeah. Um, the Pareto principle, or then like the interpersonal ones, like there's one called Hanlon's Razor, I think, yeah. right? Yeah. Never attribute to malice what could be equally explained Goodwill. by stupidity. Or, yeah. yeah, stupidity, yes. So then it gives you a level of grace when you're dealing with other people. You're like, oh, they're probably not being a dick. They're probably just like not dumb confident. or something. <laughs> or like they're, they're not thinking, I yeah. don't know, right? Or yeah. they might be having a bad day yeah. or something. Yeah. And then that allows you to then respond better to that person. Yeah. And then your outcome is better, right? Yeah. And so, I don't know, they seem like an organizing function to make you better at, at life yeah. in general. They're all little operating frameworks. Did, do you have the Farnham Street books? The mental model I bought, books? Um, I bought his critical thinking book or clear thinking, I think, that just came out. How is that one? I haven't read it yet. Okay, <laughs> I'll let you know. What it's I like did. the the. It, what's weird is like we start to hear all these book re recommendations on podcasts, and then the books keep stacking up. Mm -hmm. And so like now I'm out of library space, so I have to get more like ladders. I'm deep on books because I think yeah. a lot of a lot of my friends wrote books this year. Yeah, so I have like five of my. Isn't friends it weird? Books. Yeah. It's like in the last two three years or so, Noah has a book. I, you know, everyone's working. Cody's Cody has a book coming out. Yeah, I yeah. just got Noah's book. I have yeah. I've yet to read that one. Eric put out his second book. He yeah. did the the Navalmanac, then the, the Almanac Balaji Naval. one. Then he did the Balaji one. I think yeah. he's working on an Elon one. Oh, is he? I think okay. I'm not sure, but I think yeah. he might be. That's that's such a good angle. It's a great yeah. Yeah. for people that will never write a book. 
Just do it for them. Just write their book, write yeah. their story. Yeah. yeah, and that one was cool because you saw him build the Naval book basically on Twitter in yeah. public. That did know? well. Did really well. Yeah. I think he just sold his millionth copy like a couple months ago. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's major. And yeah. now he's running Scribe. Now he's running Scribe. Yeah. It's a very weird funny? full circle moment, right? Yeah. Yeah. What, what, so speaking of books, what, what's I'm curious, what, what's in your learning stack? You know, this might be a weird take, but I haven't read too many books in the last few years just because I'm building. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I spent a lot of my 20s. The flaw I think I had in my 20s is I thought you could read about the world, build a full model of how the world works, and then go into the world and then just like instantly know everything to do. And so I spent probably the post-poker time of my early 20s reading like hundreds of books, yeah. personal development, you know, science, fiction, mm-hmm. all this sort of stuff. And then I realized like, I just wasn't doing shit with my life. I just yeah. wasn't actually doing, taking actions. Uh, and and so I hard switched in my like early 30s to just like doing stuff and not reading at least books. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm on Twitter, I'm reading blog articles, I'm reading like sort of more real-time information stuff, mm-hmm. but I haven't, I haven't read a ton in the last year or so. Got it. Yeah, I mean, to your point, you can't really build pattern recognition by reading other people's experiences. You actually mm-hmm. have to go do it yourself. Yeah, and plus, like when you have enough of these models or enough of this wisdom from others, you do have to like fact check it against the world because, like, unless it's a immutable fact of the universe, like the gravitational constant or whatever, all these theories, et cetera, have like a half life with which they work, right? Mm-hmm. So, like the business book from you know the early 2010s may still be valid today, but it may not. And, right. you know, just resting on that and just act, you have to test it against the real world. Right. Yeah. Got it. I got to take a minute to tell you about the Agency Owners Association. This is a peer group for agency owners. Think YPO or EO, but for agency owners. And I just wanted to read you a couple of testimonials. So this first one comes from Carrie. And we asked her, what do you like most about the group? She said, having a group of people to discuss and bounce ideas. The leads are great too. Yes, we share leads in this group as well. This one from Alian. He says, the ability to really post whatever I want and need. And the group responds, great experienced members getting a lot of insights from conversations with other members, getting a lot of value from sessions from Eric, getting advice from others as well. And so if you want to grow your agency faster and you want a peer group to do so, just go to marketingschool.io slash agency. This is a group that both Neil and I created. And our hope here is to create a vibrant community of agency owners and do a lot more with it in the future. So again, marketingschool.io slash agency, and we'll see you inside. You're mostly on like the Twitters of the world and maybe like YouTube and stuff. YouTube is is the university of life yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've learned incredible, incredible amounts on YouTube. And usually it's from those videos that are like yeah. 4,000 views, Yeah, you know, with yeah. someone that's like maybe not that great at actually presenting on YouTube, but they're mm-hmm. the one person who knows the thing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, YouTube, Twitter, just talking to people. Yeah. What's working right now? What's not? What are you feeling? You know? Yeah. You know how Jeff Bezos talks about how he putters in the morning, which is where he just kind of, just kind of sits around for maybe an hour or two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know how how many hours a day do you think you spend like puttering or just maybe maybe learning on YouTube or something like that? I would say if I'm not working and not like working out or hanging out with my girlfriend or family, I'm kind of am puttering. I'm kind of like reading about this one thing that seems interesting or like going down a weird rabbit hole and then like mm-hmm. going, oh, wow, I could actually apply that in this way to this thing yeah. in this part of the business with that person, you know? Yeah. And then you try it and it works yeah. or it doesn't work and yeah. you're always just refining. Yeah. So you're looking for ideas to take action on. Pretty much yeah. all the time, yeah. Got it. Um, so let's move back to YouTube for a second and we, we can work towards wrapping here. So you, you, you have a new YouTube channel on top of all your other YouTube channels. Can you explain what you're talking about there? Oh, what the yeah. goal is? Yeah, the, the personal channel was made because I think probably for two core reasons. One, the ego of can I make a channel that people enjoy and they get value from that isn't about gardening, right? So like, can I do this in another field? I just wanted to see if I could do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the goal maybe is, say, get get a silver plaque for 100k yeah, yeah and then this the secondary purpose was i talk about gardening like a lot you know so having a conversation with you on something like this is like pretty rare for me mm-hmm. or just making content in general about things that i'm interested in that aren't gardening so i just needed a dumping ground mentally yeah, yeah. for all those ideas and yeah. i can't not want to put something out i think it's just innate within me like even when i was a kid my cousin and i we were on Geo cities. We, oh, yeah, yeah. we had like a tripod. how to draw. Yeah, tripod. Yeah, 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 like yeah. CJB, all those things. We had a we had a, a thing on how to draw anime no. when I was like 10. And we didn't know how to draw anime. Yeah. We were like looking at a book, learning how to draw anime, yeah. and then like scanning our pictures and yeah, putting yeah, up like yeah. how to draw anime yeah. eyes. And that was like when we were 10. So I think I've always had that like 
need to create stuff and mm-hmm. like put it out into the world. And so the the personal channel is just my avenue to do that yeah. about whatever the hell I want. I think it's a good takeaway because when I was like, we're around the same age, nine or 10, um, I was making like MP3 websites. Yeah. And I started making EverQuest websites because I was playing EverQuest. Um, but it's like the need, you just have to go out there and create. Like again, it comes down to like, you don't develop pattern recognition by reading. No, yeah. no. And plus like the people I meet that that are doing pretty well, with some sort of business in general, but a lot of the times it's a business that has some interface with the internet, is they're all sort of game-minded in, in their nature. Mm-hmm. Whether it's poker or a lot of competitive video game people end up doing well, a lot of uh, traders end up doing well. Yeah, And I think it's just the need to play. Like, it's fun to just play. Yes. You know? Um, yeah. Especially once you reach a point where you've done well and, yeah. you know, at least for me, I'm a gardener, yeah. right? Like, I don't have some crazy expensive lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, so Is that how you introduce yourself sometimes? I'm a gardener. <laughs> I tend to troll a little bit and just say I'm a gardener. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. what's the whole thing? Like, if you have to flex, then then you you failed, right? So yeah. Just, just what, what's the most sort of baseline? Like, what would you say if someone asked you who, what you up, were up I'm, to? I'm a podcaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You like pick the least cool thing yeah. that you do, yeah, right? Like, yeah. Well, on what? I, I don't know. Um, yeah, marketing. Yeah, but marketing. Yeah, you know uh, who else does this? Syed does this. So we'll, we'll I, I'll, I'll always be observing. So he has you know the WordPress holding company, mm-hmm. and people walk up to him. So he's like, "What do you do?" Um, and I remember like a prominent CMO walked up to him um, at one of my events, and he said, "Oh, I'm a blogger." And the guy like rolled his like eyes glazed. and like walked away. Yeah, <laughs> and then he's like, "Yeah, you don't even know who you're talking to." I know. So, yeah. So yeah, there's a weird. Like level one flex would be to say exactly what you are, right? Yeah. So he'd be like, "Oh, I'm actually on this insanely huge WordPress holding company." Yeah. Level two would be to denigrate yourself basically and let them walk away, and then you still feel cooler because yeah. you did that, yeah, right. Yeah. And then level three would probably just to somehow become Buddha and like detach from all of that, right? Yeah. And I don't think I'm at, at that level yeah. yet. Yeah, so you're level two right now. I might be level two. Maybe yeah. I'm sometimes level one. Who so, so what is the interaction? You tell people you're a gardener. What, what do you usually get? I I I would usually say something like, oh, like I, I teach people how to grow plants mm-hmm. is usually what I would say. Yeah. Um, and if they want to follow up, then I'll say, yeah, like we make YouTube videos, we make podcasts, yeah. we make blog articles yeah. and stuff. And yeah. Because it's boring to me to talk about what I do mm-hmm. to others. I'd rather hear like what they're up to. Yeah. You know? Same here. Yeah. And on the way to lunch, you talked about how you don't do any shorts at all, right? Um, for your main channel. We were just basically saying we that do some. longs yeah. is like, that's where it's at. And I think people are over indexing on shorts. Yeah. It's, it's, it's almost become like an addictive drug. There's been, I think there's like a revolt on shorts that is either here or coming. I, my theory is that it's actually here right now. Yeah. Cause I think Gen Z is aware of, they're, they're very media literate compared to let's say boomers or even millennials because they grew up effectively they grew up with the internet and they grew up with basically like web one to web two mm-hmm. gen alpha grew up, grew up with web two like they were born after twitter after facebook you know right. after youtube right but they're all so savvy now and they're the primary consumers of this media right and so they're seeing through it in a way that like i don't know boomers on facebook can't even tell if it's ai or not yeah. you know yeah um and and gen z's seeing through it and i think where everyone on earth is probably fatiguing a bit from the short form. Yep. And they're also seeing all the patterns of how they get hooked. Yeah. Right. So they're they're getting a little bit meta about it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I agree. Like we we put shorts on TikTok first. If they do well, we put them on IG and Facebook. If those do well, the best of the best will go to YouTube. Right. Because the YouTube audience is just so valuable. Yeah. Uh, so I don't want to like just spam shorts on that. Got it. It sounds like what's old is new again. It's like everything goes back to long form. Everything goes mm-hmm. back to long term relationship building. I think everything, yeah, because the longer you spend with a creator, the more of a parasocial relationship you build with them. And I have that with other creators, right? Yeah. Like if I watch some some YouTuber for a long time, I yeah. feel like I know them, even though I'm a YouTuber, and I know that when people come up to me and think they know me, I know they don't know me, right? And I know they think they do. And so this, the, I'm I'm both types of people depending on you know which side of the interaction I'm on. Got it. Yeah. Last thing. So we, we talked about kind of pre-show. You as an entrepreneur, how are you optimizing for your health? Man, for a while I was not, and that was the problem. And I would just be like on the computer or making content or at the warehouse, shipping product, et cetera. And then just like eating whatever could get to me so I could keep doing that. And I think I'm 6'4", and I think maybe around the time of the pandemic or slightly before when Epic really started to kick into high gear, 
I was probably about 220, 225 pounds. Last year, January 2023, I was like almost 260. Wow. And I can hide it on a big frame. It doesn't mean it's good for you though. Um, yeah. And so I, I started dropping weight. I did the 75 hard challenge with my girlfriend, dropped like 20 pounds. And now I'm getting into more of the like internal health stuff, like gut health, food quality, which is ironic as a gardener. Like when I eat from the garden, it's exceptionally healthy food. The yeah. problem is if I don't, right? Um, and so, yeah. When you I'm, go outside. Yeah, just yeah, go yeah. get a pizza yeah. or go get a burrito yeah. or something like that. Um, and then I also realized, I don't know if this is something you dealt with at all in your journey is the, the desire to kind of mute the stress via like eating bad food. Mm -hmm. Like everyone has those types of vices, right? Or like playing video games or something like that. For me, it was the food. And so it just showed up on my face. And unfortunately, as a YouTuber, you have a permanent record of how you look <laughs> at every point in time. Yeah. So I know like from like 2021-ish to 2023 early, I know I just look like bloated and stressed and I can tell at least. Mm -hmm. uh, and I go, wow, it's just frozen forever. Some of my yeah. biggest banger videos are when I'm in that <laughs> state of being, right? And it's just like frozen forever in that state, yeah. which is kind of annoying. But yeah. yeah. Got wait, so what what are you doing exactly? So I'm I've been starting to run. Uh -huh. Um I run like two or three times a week. I have been doing like massage protocol stuff. I've been doing some of the blood testing work. Mm -hmm. And then it's just like for me, it's it's the diet. Yeah. The diet is the heart, has always been the most challenging part yeah. for me, and so I'm just cooking more. My girlfriend's yeah. cooking more. I'm cooking more. Yeah, like all organic food. Well, the beauty is, I I could live in summer. I could live probably nearly exclusively off the garden because I have chickens, right? Because yeah. it's hard to grow protein. It's hard yeah. to grow fat unless you have chickens. Are you slaughtering them? No. Okay. No, just the eggs. Okay. Yeah, just the eggs. Because we'll get like eight or nine <laughs> eggs a day yeah. in summer. I was like, damn. So if you're eating eight good. or nine eggs a day, like yeah. you're in a good, you're in a good spot protein yeah. wise. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I gotta visit your farm. That that will be the next conversation. Yeah, but, you can but, do a podcast down at the farm. But, yeah. That would be cool. Yeah. This has been good. Mm -hmm. Great. What's the best way for people to find you online? Just search Epic Gardening if you're into it. Or if you want to see the personal stuff, you can just search my name on YouTube. Kevin Esprit too. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. Thanks.